Galileo and the Bat, in which is feared that the quality of experience cannot be derived from matter. No explorer can resist a cave. Promise of depth and secrets. So Galileo had penetrated deep into the cave. Sure, it would guard a revelation. But eagerness had lured him too far inside, and now he stood uncertain where to go. His purpose lost, nothing for him to see save his own blindness. And then the fear began. He imagined dark shadows trembling on distant walls. His fingers felt the rock's wet face, scared it would break loose. His foot slid over the brittle edge, and his heart plunged toward the abyss, bolting from the weak hold of his will. Then came the flutter. Suddenly, from the unfathomable heights over his shoulders came the flutter, and it was made less of sound than of cold air that briefly touched his brow and froze his sweat. It was a flutter like the flutter of a bat, but not an ordinary bat, as if a giant vulture would fly as swiftly as a bat. Each time the flutter came closer, and it was chilling. The cave had been violated. The bat was certain now. Finally it had happened, he thought. He had been careless, loitering in the air without a purpose, wasting time in useless dances, when he should have built ramparts and traps. And now it was too late. The intruder must be of hefty size, perhaps extraordinary size, not one of the small crunchers that on and off disturb the quiet of the night, but can be silenced in a sweep. And its echo was confusing, thought the bat. Perhaps it hid behind the seventh bridge, and from behind the bridge he felt the deafening heat. He should have built stronger defences, he thought collapsing arches and piercing entrapments. But now it was too late. The intruder had trampled all his trenches, and it was breathing heavily, not far from the inner chamber. The bat swept again close to the bridge, trying to echo the intruder from a safe distance. Then, turning swiftly in mid-air, he felt a sudden twang, a twang of unhearable intensity. What was this twang? A twang so concentrated and powerful, it filled his mouth with juices. A twang that was drawing him irresistibly to an aspiration wider and deeper, fuller and heavier than any before. The bat quivered with dread. The heat behind the bridge was allowed. There could not be any hope to aspirate the intruder. He heard again the twang, drawing him closer. Oh, thought the bat. Despite the twang, despite the twang he must resist, perhaps the intruder was so powerful that it could aspirate a cruncher twice his size, maybe ten times his size. Perhaps it was so cunning that it could strike him onto his own impaling traps. Certainly, it had come to turn his chamber into a grave, waiting behind the bridge only to show unholy force at the last instant. So he would fall, doomed by his sloth, thought the bat. And then he thought, at least he'll fall with a twang filling his mind. A twang so intense it would occupy it fully and leave no room for dread. Perhaps that was the way to fall. He felt his wings fluttering irresponsibly. He felt juices spilling from the fissures in his mouth, and the echo became distorted, enlarged, out of focus. The heat was growing louder and nearer, and the body was ready to swing, and then again he felt it. The twang, the strongest, most acute twang he had known, and he flew himself headlong, at magnificent speed, with a wide, arched whoop, behind the shadow of the seventh bridge, toward the roaring of the heat. Galileo shuddered when he returned to his senses. A giant bat lay there, lifeless, his secret bird inside his skull. But voices were approaching, hunters perhaps, and they were arguing. Behind the rock they could not see Galileo. Just what I meant, said a man named N. We shall never know what a twang feels like, no matter how passionately you ask a bat. 
how assiduously you study its brain. Does a vulture hate the smell of carrion? And what do moray eels think when they, like sphinxes, stare unmoved out of their rocky holes, like question marks of stone? How sure, man of little faith? A voice replied from the darkness. It could have been Frick's voice, but there was no Frick. Because, continued Anne, even if we knew for sure that a system is conscious, we would never know what kind of consciousness it has. Because when experience comes, it comes in qualities that cannot be reduced to anything else. A flash of light is different, irreducibly, from the ring of a bell or from twinges of pain. The color of the sky is different, irreducibly, from the shape of the sun. Nothing can explain why colors look the way they do, why red is red and blue is blue, why colors look different from shapes and different from the way music sounds. Or pain feels. Nothing can explain why a twang feels like a twang. And finally, said Anne, because nothing that is made of matter, nothing by any stretch of imagination can hope to explain the quality of mind. Never mind, replied the other voice. Mind the facts. Mind that damage to certain parts of the cerebral cortex forever eliminates our ability to see but not to hear or to feel pain. That damage to other parts eliminates our ability to hear but not to see, and yet other parts, if damaged, only affect pain. And mind that within the visual regions of the cortex, certain parts are necessary to see shapes, but not colors, others to perceive colors and not shapes. Now Galileo could see Anne's head, and it was shaking politely. I concede it freely. There may be a special relationship between certain areas of the brain and certain qualities of our experience, he said. But that relationship is and will remain imperscrutable, just like every other relationship between matter and mind. Each of us lives in a cave without openings, just like the bat. Wait until a piece of matter of your brain turns to sludge, and you will gain a better perspective on matter and mind, said the voice. I met a painter once who had lost a spoonful of brain porridge, one particular spoonful. All was fine with him except without that spoonful, everything to him was grey and dirty. And he couldn't see, remember, imagine, or even dream of colour. He saw food grey on the plate, his wife grey on the bed, but for the rest his consciousness was just like mine. He had merely lost the special qualities of colour, qualia, as you philosophers call them, and that was due to a dead piece of porridge. If a slightly different spoonful had been damaged, he would have lost faces instead of colours or sounds or the urgency of ethics. So there is something about how different areas of the brain are organized that makes them contribute different qualities to consciousness. Sounds and sights, smells and pains, shapes and colors. That may be true, but still it is no use. No miracle will ever distill the bright red wine of consciousness out of the grey water of the brain, said Anne. Go ahead! Reveal in darkness a pig's revel in mud, said the voice. Imperscrutable. How did it sound when you were born? How did red wine taste when all you had experienced was milk and water? Surely you are a connoisseur by now. Your sensations developed and refined. You are a philosopher. But that is just the point. Development and refinement. How did they come about? There is no mystery in nature's book. They may come from a rearrangement of connections among certain neurons in your brain. There is no knowing what it is like to be a pig. Or I would say you are pig-headed, said Anne affably. Fortunately, that is philosophically impossible, or at least imperscrutable. Think of the poor bat. Assuming it was conscious... How did it experience the world it sensed through its sonar, sniffing the echo of things? 
Was its experience of the world more like a vision? Was it instead sound like, or was it completely alien? And what is a twang like? Is it like a twinge, or like a twang? Maybe in between, or completely different. Nothing, you'll say, will ever explain what it is like to be a bat, to feel a twang. No, nothing in matter can explain the quality of mind. And I shall add, and went on, if you don't care for the bat, think of yourself instead. Think of darkness, how it feels. Think of a pain, then of the sound of water falling. Why should darkness feel exactly the way it feels and not feel otherwise? Why should it not feel like a bright blue sky? Why shouldn't blue feel green instead? Or feel like pain and pain feel like darkness? Why should the fragrance of fresh bread not feel like the pangs of shame for not knowing the answer? Why, for that matter, should it not feel like a twang? Galileo lost track of the voices and could not hear the response to what Anne had said. But Galileo was not going to accept that the kind of consciousness a system has is arbitrary. He was not going to abandon his old friend, the principle of sufficient reason. There must be a reason for anything to be the way it is and not another way. Just as the presence of consciousness depends on the functioning of the brain, so does its quality. That was the second problem of consciousness. What determines the specific way consciousness is? There must be something, some necessary and sufficient conditions, that determine exactly what kind of experience one has, thought Galileo. And the moment those conditions are understood, therein lies the explanation. What was this something? It could not be some material attribute of a particular piece of brain. There was nothing red about the particular nerve cells that were necessary for perceiving red. Nothing blue about those other cells that must turn on for us to see blue. Perhaps the explanation was to be sought at a different level where the consciousness was present, and where it was generated, he had come to think, was determined not by any property of neural cells, but by the quantity of integrated information generated by a complex of neural elements. Then, perhaps, the specific way consciousness is, its quality, was determined not by any property of cells within a complex, but by the specific way the information was generated, or so he thought. Notes This chapter is sadly underdeveloped, a half-hearted attempt at consciousness a second problem, as confused as Galileo in the cave and, logically, as jerky as the flight of the bat, Yes, one gets the double perspective in Plato's cave, Galileo's frightened but familiar consciousness on one side, the heroic bat's alien consciousness on the other, but then there is a cacophony of voices that float in mid-air but offer no clear answer or solution. The problem, though, is obvious enough. Anybody who has ever faced a moray eel staring back from an undersea hole in enigmatic immobility, like an old sphinx posing a metaphysical interrogative, will have wondered what his counterpart might be experiencing and what it might be thinking. A bat is also a case in point, although it would be unlikely to stare back at us with philosophic poise. While morays would have been a better choice, Bats have an illustrious pedigree. The philosopher Thomas Nagel, in the essay What is it like to be a bat? Philosophical Review 1974, shows such a creature, perhaps neither bird nor mammal, to make the case that the quality of consciousness will lay forever beyond the realm of science. Clearly, all the twangs recurring in the chapter, apparently an all-important concept for the bat, but meaningless for us, are meant to illustrate the unbridgeable gap between bad experience and human experience.